really excited to introduce our speaker for today, Kareem Yap, who's coming to us from Rutgers to talk about a really cool problem in multicolored hypergraph Ramsey theory. Great. Thank you so much, Emily, and all the organizers for inviting me. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk about work that's joint with uh, three other collaborators, Quentin Dubroff, who is another graduate student at Rutgers, uh, Antonio Quirao, who is uh, a postdoc at Oxford, and Owen Hurley, who's a grad student at University of Heidelberg. Um, okay, so let me start uh, by just setting up some notation and giving some definitions to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to be talking exclusively about K-uniform hypergraphs. Uh, so in case you're not familiar with those, we'll start with a K-uniform hypergraph. And what we have is just a set of vertices, V, and we have a collection of edges where edges are just subsets of the vertices. And K uniform means we specify all of them to have size K. Uh, is a collection of subsets of V, all of size K. And I'm mainly going to be talking about uh, well, I'm going to be talking about Ramsey numbers, so of course we have to start with complete K-uniform hypergraphs, and I'll use the notation K sub N superscript K to mean the complete K-uniform hypergraph on N vertices. So this is the complete K-uniform hypergraph on N vertices. So every subset of size k is an edge. Um, and the, so that's these things. And let's start out with just a, a cl the classical version of um, hypergraph Ramsey numbers, which I'll use this notation r sub k of t. And this will be the minimum number of vertices so that when I have any two coloring of my complete K-uniform hypergraph, I must have a monochromatic clique of size T. So that might sound familiar if you know about just regular old graph Ramsey theory. Now we're just putting it in the K-uniform setting. So this is the minimum number of vertices N such that every two coloring of the complete K-uniform hypergraph on N vertices has a monochromatic KT inside, clique of size T. Uh, okay, so let's just start with this classical Ramsey number. So if you are not familiar with hypergraph Ramsey numbers, but Hopefully everyone in this room has seen, you know, the normal old Ramsey numbers before. Uh, then maybe the first result you would see in a combinatorics or a graph theory class is that r sub 2 of 3 is equal to 6, right? And what does this statement mean? Well, there are actually two things that go into the statement. So in general, when we're proving Ramsey, uh, things about Ramsey numbers, there are two proofs that go into that, a lower bound and an upper bound. And we'll be talking about both today. Um, so there are two statements, r sub 2 of 3 is greater than 5, and how do you prove that? You need to show that you can find a two coloring with no monochromatic triangles inside. So there exists a two coloring of the complete graph K5 with no monochromatic triangles. And then the other half of the statement is that r sub 2 of 3 is at most 6. And for that, we want to take an arbitrary coloring and show we must have a monochromatic triangle. So for any two coloring of k6, there exists a monochromatic triangle. So all red or all blue. Red and blue are your two colors. Um, OK. so. Uh, you know, 
a lot of people have studied you know, normal old graph Ramsey numbers, but now let's take a look at what happens in the hypergraph world. Sort of the next one that you might want to explore is just bumping up k from 2 to 3. What happens when we're in the 3 uniform case? So what do we know about k equals 3? Uh, and it's a classical result from Erdős, Heinel, and Ratto in 1964, um, which says that we know asymptotically about where this be the behavior of the three uniform Ramsey numbers should lie. Um, we know that there are some constants such that R3 of t is between exponential and double exponential in t, uh, the size of our clique. And that's basically all we know to this day. There still continues to be this gap of one exponential between the lower and the upper bounds. Um, and a lot of work has been done to try and close this gap. And I want to say a little bit about why this is an interesting problem for a lot of people. Um, on one hand, yes, it's just sort of an annoying open problem of why can't we do anything more than this. But actually, proving the case for k equals 3 could potentially have implications for higher uniformity Ramsey numbers because of something called the stepping up lemma. So Erdős and Heinel in 72 have something called the stepping up lemma. Um, and there are a few different versions of it, but one version says that you can take the Ramsey number for a k plus 1 uniform hypergraph, and you can find lower bounds for it using the k uniform Ramsey number. So remember, what do lower bounds mean? They mean that we can find specific colorings. We construct specific colorings. So what this bound says is essentially we can take uh, a lower bound for the k uniform Ramsey number by taking a, a, let's say, a good coloring for k uniform, which means no monochromatic cliques. And the idea is you step it up to a coloring of a k plus 1 uniform hypergraph, a very particular one, and you construct your coloring in the k plus 1 uniform world based on what the coloring was in the k uniform world. And you show that if this coloring had the particular property of no monochromatic cliques, then this coloring also has this property where you know, your clique size is a little bit bigger. Um, OK, so uh, what does this mean? What does the stepping up lemma imply for the case of k equals 3? Well, this allows us to get lower bounds for higher uniformity Ramsey numbers by just recursively applying bounds and stepping up k each time. So if we apply uh, the stepping up, to R3T, we get that, uh, let's say the R3T bounds, we get that RK of T um, is at least, let's say, a tower of height K minus 1 of CT. I think this should be squared over here. Um, where you know you define you can define the tower function as uh, this recursive thing where the tower of height i is two to the tower of height i minus one, right? So by just applying the stepping up to this lower bound, we get this lower bound for all higher uniformities k bigger than three. And Erdős and Heinel and Rado also showed in their same first paper that we do have. Uh, an upper bound that, again, has some gap of one tower height. So in fact, if we were able to close this gap for k equals 3, if we were able to say that R3 actually behaves like a double exponential, then it, could potentially, it would close the gap for all higher uniformities. So solving this problem would have a lot of really big implications. Uh, I'm not here to claim that we've done that. We certainly have not <laughs> closed this gap. Um, but there are some different avenues that people have taken to um, try and tackle this problem. Uh, and one is just, let's try and generalize our notions of, of, of how we define our Ramsey numbers 
and see if we can prove anything more general. And one natural way to generalize is just to use more colors and see what happens. So what happens with more colors? OK, so I'm going to define, I'm just going to add a new parameter to my Ramsey numbers, r sub k t q. And this will be the same thing as before, but now I allow q colors. So the minimum n such that every q coloring of the complete uniform hypergraph, k uniform hypergraph, has a monochromatic kt. Okay, and uh, what Erdős uh, and Heinel also showed in the same 72 paper was uh, a result for just using four colors instead of two colors. And they actually showed that in the four color case, we do get a double exponential lower bound, which is what we wanted in the two color case. Uh, and several years later, Conlin, Fox, and Sudakov in 2010 showed in the intermediary three color case that we do get at least something super exponential. Uh, let's see, log t. Um, and Erdős actually conjectured that this should be the case for two colors as well. That the truth for two colors is double exponential. And this is, you know, some evidence that maybe that's true. Um, one sort of perspective you could take on this conjecture is like, oh, the number of colors doesn't matter. So one way you could read this is, you know, whatever the truth is for four or three colors or for ten colors, it should all be the same, you know, asymptotically as we go into the limit. Uh, and again, we still don't know that this is true, but this is sort of a new type of question that we can tackle in general what effect does the number of colors have on the asymptotic behavior of your Ramsey numbers? Um, so does um, having more colors change the asymptotic behavior? And OK, what's one way we could just tackle this question by itself? Well, one way that people have tried is, OK, let's generalize this Ramsey notion even more. Let's not think about what happens with cliques, because we clearly don't know what happens with cliques. Let's try other types of hypergraphs and see how the number of colors plays with those families of hypergraphs. So I'm going to introduce. And as I introduce more and more notation, it will be less and less important for you to remember <laughs> what it means, as I'll try to remind you of what they mean whenever I use them. Um, but they'll all just be variations on the original notation that I introduced. But now we have this RK of GQ, where instead of looking for monochromatic KTs, I'm now looking for monochromatic copies of G. So this is the min N, such that every Q coloring of K and K uniform has a monochromatic copy of G, where G is some other K uniform hypergraph. Uh, OK, so, so what's happening here? Can we come up with a family of K uniform hypergraphs where there is this difference between the two color and you know, higher color Ramsey numbers? And a surprising answer from Conlon, Fox, and Riddle was yes, we actually can find this family of hypergraphs um, that exhibit this sort of strong sensitivity to the number of colors that you use. So Conlon, Fox, and Riddle, not too long ago in 2017, so they show that there exists a family of three uniform, but you can generalize it to higher uniformity, but they mainly showed for three uniform hypergraphs, which they called hedgehogs. 
and I'll in a minute uh, explain what these hedgehogs are, such that the um, two color Ramsey number is bounded above by a polynomial uh, in the size of the graph. And the four color Ramsey number is at least uh, is at least exponential. Sorry, not double exponential. Okay. And there's some parameters that I'm, you know, so I, I sort of wrote it out in words because there's some parameters I didn't want to write out. Um, but I will in a second when I explain what the construction is. Uh, so this was somewhat surprising for everybody who thought like, oh, if Erdős's conjecture is true, the way we're going to do this is by showing that the number of colors doesn't matter. Uh, and they asked in this paper, can you do even worse? Can you get arbitrarily large tower gaps between the two color and the Q color for some Q? So large tower gaps between the two color and Q color Ramsey numbers. for some family. Uh, and so our answer to that was yes. You can make this gap arbitrarily as bad as you want. And we do this by uh, taking a generalization of their construction that we call balanced hedgehogs. So we let h of t with a hat be the balanced hedgehog. And that's because h of t without the hat is just a hedgehog. And so this is our uh, theorem. So let me make sure I get the numbers right. We can find some constant and some function q. So our number of colors will be a function of the uniformity, but it won't, it'll only depend on the uniformity. So that for all k and t large enough, we have, and now I'm going to 2k plus 1 uniform Ramsey numbers just because it's easier to write 2k and k versus k and k over 2. Uh, but I could have written this in terms of k. So our two color Ramsey number of this hedgehog is at most a polynomial in T, which has to do with the size of our hedgehog. And if we look at the Q color Ramsey number, where Q is some function of K, this is at least a tower of height log log uh, K. Okay, so not quite linear in K, which is maybe what you would want, and I'll, I'll try and address a little bit of why we get this log log K, but the point is, is that um, this does give us sort of these arbitrary gaps between the two and the Q color Ramsey numbers. Okay, so let me now tell you what this construction is. Uh, what are these hedgehogs? So in the Conlon, Fox, and Riddle paper, we had hedgehogs. And what you do is you take a body of t vertices. And for every set of size k minus 1, you add a unique vertex on the outside of the body. You can call this the spine. And you use that to complete the edge. And so for the three uniform case, it was, you know, you take pairs of vertices and you add these extra vertices on the outside and they look like spines. And so this one will also have a third vertex on the outside. Yeah. So there are, you add a total of n choose two vertices in the, in the three uniform case. Is that the picture I should be? Yes. At? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so this, um, you can also generalize it to k uniform um, 
And there you would be adding uh, and choose k minus 1, uh, extra vertices. And for us, when we had the balanced hedgehog, We're doing the same thing, except now we're taking every set of size k over 2. We're adding a unique, you know, disjoint sets of size k over 2 on the outside, and that's completing our edge. So we have another set of size k over 2, and we add a separate k over 2 on the outside. And then you take floors and ceilings appropriately um, if, if k is odd. I think we did like this. That doesn't make a huge difference. So, I, and again, this is t vertices. On the inside. Uh, and even for some other, some of the sort of lemmas that went into this, you could prove it for something called the generalized hedgehog, where you have a new parameter S, uh, and that just says you take a, every set of S vertices on the inside and add K minus S on the outside, and that's your edge. Um, so you can make it even more general. Uh, okay, but that is the, the hedgehog construction. Um, and so now with the rest of the time, I want to talk uh, about what goes into these proofs. Um, for A, it's pretty straightforward and follows what happens with uh, the common Fox and Riddle paper. Um, so the main ideas I'll be talking about are what went into B, and I'll go into more details of the stepping up construction that I mentioned earlier. Um, but before I get into proofs, are there any questions about anything that has been brought up so far? spend too much time on A, but I'll give like a little bit of a sketch as to what goes in this upper bound. So what we want to do is take an arbitrary two coloring on polynomially many vertices and show we must have a monochromatic hedgehog. So arbitrary two coloring of poly vertices show that it has a monochromatic hedgehog. Um, and we do a couple of pretty standard things in Ramsey theory, which is that we pass to some auxiliary colorings and then do a greedy construction. Um, so we look first, we start with a coloring of the 2k plus 1 sets. That's the arbitrary red blue coloring we start with. We pass to a new coloring of the k plus 1 sets. And the way that we do this is we take, uh, we look at a set of k plus 1 vertices. If it's in few red edges in here, we color it red in here. So red if inside few red sets in chi. Where few, we pick it sort of so that the numbers work out in the end. And we do it again. We pass to a coloring of the vertices. And we do the same thing, where we um, color a vertex red if it's in few red sets under the chi prime color. And then what we do is we, OK, one of these color classes of the vertices has to be at least half of them. So we take some big red set. We go back. What does it mean to have a big red set? Well, they were uh, red because they were in few red vertices over here. So we can find a big blue set. And then what does it mean that they were blue over here? Well, they were in few blue edges over here. So that means we can find a big red set. And we sort of arbitrate, we, we greedily embed our edges that way so that we get our monochromatic, in this case, our red hedgehog. So that's the main idea. Yeah. So is there, is, there must be something important that 2k plus 1 goes to k plus 1 goes to 1. Yes. Okay. Um, so the thing here is that when we go from this chi to this chi prime, it ends up being a partial coloring and not a full coloring. Um, by how we define um, how few. Uh, and so what can happen in this middle coloring is that um, an edge might have been in uh, both many red and blue sets in here. Um, because the way we define few is not exactly half. Uh, but then it, it, when we pass it here, we do get a full coloring of the vertices chi double prime. 
And the reason when we go back it's important to have two is um, because we want to be able to greedily embed the spines here. So we want uh, a body that is um, where we can find most of the red edges containing that body sort of outside. And we can uh, greedily embed the red edges using things that are outside of the body because the edges have to be destroyed. Yeah. So I'm skimming over a lot of the details, but that's sort of the main argument. OK, so let me, let me spend some more time then on the second part, which is uh, with the lower bounds. So for B, what we want to do is we want to construct a good coloring. And good will mean one thing for now, and then it'll mean something different in a moment. Um, so the main ideas that we use here are to relax the monochromatic condition and apply stepping up lemma. So that's sort of the last thing that we can generalize in our original definition of Ramsey number, and that's what we do. Um, because what does it mean here to have no monochromatic hedgehog in a coloring? That's the same thing as saying every hedgehog spans at least two colors. And what we can do is we can look at colorings where every hedgehog spans at least two colors, and we can relate this to colorings where cliques span many colors. And so what this is going to do is take our Ramsey number for hedgehogs and put it back in the world of just Ramsey numbers for cliques. And we have tools for dealing with Ramsey numbers for cliques, mainly stepping up lemmas. Uh, so the main lemma that does this, and there are some sort of parameter obstructions that I'll, I'll talk about here, maybe towards the end. Um, let P be 2K plus 1. Oh, I should maybe define something first. Uh, actually, let me put it all on, because it's not, this and the definition are not going to both fit here. So I'm going to go over here and then write a definition and then write the one. OK, so I mentioned that we want to talk about cliques spanning many colors. So this is the last bit of notation. I'll write down, and this is maybe the one that you uh, definitely don't have to remember if you don't feel like it, which you probably won't feel like it. Um, so I've added this new, this final parameter, P, and this is to relax the monochromatic condition to spanning um, at most P colors. So this will be the minimum N, such that every Q coloring of the complete K uniform hypergraph on N vertices, uh, such that uh, for any Q coloring, every copy, or sorry, no, 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 that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> every Q coloring of K and K contains a copy of G spanning fewer than P colors. So remember, this used to say monochromatic. Which is the same as spanning one color. And now we're just relaxing that to say spanning at most P colors. Uh, and now let me write down the lemma I was about to write down which was, OK, we have to deal with these parameters that go in the Ramsey numbers. And we have this sort of odd condition on the P that we choose, which is that it's 2K plus 1 choose K plus 1. And this Q. But the point of this lemma is that for our hedgehogs that we were talking about earlier, we can get a lower bound via cliques. 
Um, so maybe maybe a better way to let's say write this is this. The T there, uh, the second T. Yes. And, uh, so according to your notation, it's a graph. So is that uh, the notation here? The G. Yes. Uh, R K G. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. So this should be the clique. Sorry. Yeah. This should be a clique. Thank you. Um, okay, so there's a lot of notation here, and uh, but what does this mean? This means let me take a coloring, uh, a good coloring for cliques, and by good here I mean a coloring where every copy of a clique spans many colors, so is far from monochromatic. And using that coloring with let's say rainbow cliques in it, I produce a coloring where I have all of my hedgehogs spanning at least two colors. So sort of I have a coloring in the k plus one uniform case with rainbow cliques, and I use that to make a coloring in the two k plus one uniform case with rainbow hedgehogs. Um, and the way that you do that, maybe you could guess from these p and q definitions, is that I just take an edge in my two k plus one uniform case, and I look at all of the k plus one edges inside of it, they all have colors. And I just take the union of all those colors, and that's a set, and I call that a color. So it's a set of colors, and I've now called it a color in my new color. And I can use the properties of this coloring to show that I get the properties I want of this coloring. So let me not bore you with like the technical details of this, um, but I might address this lemma if I have time at the end about uh, with regards to things like open questions, because this is uh, something that I think could be poked at a little bit um, for anyone who would want to read this and improve our arguments. Uh, OK. OK, so let's see. Uh, great, so now I mainly just want to talk about stepping up. So. If you believe this lemma, then what's left is to just show lower bounds on this number. So now I'm just back in clique world, and I can prove stepping up lemmas. So now show a lower bound on rk plus 1, ht, uh, q, oh sorry, kt, kt, qp. And I'm going to do this via stepping up. So now let's forget about uh, all of the notation I've introduced, this idea of spanning many colors. Let's just go back to classical hypergraph Ramsey numbers. Let's even go back to two graphs, which are just graphs, going up to three in a form hypergraphs. So we're going to step up from two graphs to three in a form hypergraphs. Um, and ultimately, what I'm going to do is I, I want to prove something along the lines of, you know, uh, a lower bound for a three in a form Ramsey number like this. R2, T2, minus 1. Okay, so let's just prove this. And let me say the ideas that go into this. Uh, OK, so, so what happens here? Well, we start in two graph world. And we have some coloring. So let's say that our vertices are indexed by 1 through m. And we have some graph. And we have some coloring of the edges where we have no monochromatic KT. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to step up to a three uniform hypergraph. And I'm going to say that my vertices are now strings of length m, binary strings of length m. Uh, and I'm going to construct, let's say this is b prime, and my edges are e prime. I'm going to construct chi prime, so that I don't have any monochromatic cliques of size t plus 1. Okay. 
And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to define a function uh, on my uh, pairs of vertices in here. So let's say I have my edges. They're all triangles. That sends them to vertices in the two uniform case. And it will give me a way to relate the three edges in here to the two edges in here. Um, I'm going to put down some of my uh, So I have, let's say I have two vertices that are two of my binary strings of length m. And I will define something called the delta function of these two, which will just be the max coordinate at which they differ. And this allows me to get an ordering on my vertices. So if u delta is equal to 0 and v delta is equal to 1, then I say u is less than v. At the where delta, this means the coordinate where they differ. Um, and then if I have an edge, I can order it in this way, sort of canonically, v1, v2, v3. And this is in E prime. And with every edge, I can associate it with its corresponding delta sequence by just taking uh, delta of the consecutive pairs. So I get uh, delta sequence, delta 1, delta 2 which is in E. Where delta i is delta of v i, v i plus v. OK, because remember, these delta values, they're just vertices in the original graph. They're you know, in 1 through m. OK, and so the way that I can construct my new color in chi prime is by taking an edge looking at the delta sequence I get from it, and looking at two pieces of information about the delta sequence. It's color in my original graph, and it's pattern in terms of like its permutation pattern. So I will say that chi prime of E is, let's say I'll define four color classes. <coughs> And it's just all the four possibilities I could get by the different patterns of the delta sequence and the different colors. <laughs> so the first one is if I have the delta sequence is red and it's increasing, if it's red and decreasing, if it's blue and increasing, and if it's blue and decreasing. These are my four options. Um, OK. And what happens here? Well, suppose that I get a uh, monochromatic clique under this coloring. So assume for sake of contradiction. I don't know if you all use this. I used it once, and my advisor was like, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, assume for sake of contradiction. Uh, that there exists a monochromatic, let's say, C1 clique. Uh, so in this color class right here. Then what does that tell us? Um, first of all, it tells us that the delta sequence is increasing. Uh, let's say that my vertices are V1 up to Vt plus 1, clique of size t plus 1. Um, then I know that delta 1 is less than delta 2 is less than delta t. And I know that uh, for every pair of delta values, they have to be red. So if I take delta of vi, vj, and I take delta of vj, vk, then those all have, th that has to be red. Uh, okay. And so what does this immediately tell us? Um, this tells us that if I just take, let's say, vi, vi plus 1, vi plus 1, vi plus 2, 
as these vi, vj, vj, vk. This is delta i and delta i plus 1. And then I know at least I have, uh, oh, I have a red marker. I haven't even been using it. Um, I know I have at least a red path among these vertices, right? Because this is from delta 1 through delta t uh, by just taking consecutive triples. Um, but what about all these edges inside? So this is delta 1, delta 2, delta t. Uh, so this is from a property to prove for the rest of the edges, you use a property of the delta function. So property of the delta function. Um, if you take delta of any two vertices, then that value is the same as if you took the last two vertices in this ordering. So if I have any vi plus 1, vj plus 1, the delta value of that will be the same as if I just took vj, vj plus 1, which is how I've defined delta j. And so what this tells me is that actually considering consecutive pairs is enough for any pair of vertices. It's the same color as for consecutive. So that tells me that all of my edges in here are also red. Um, okay. So that's a contradiction um, because we assumed in our original coloring that we did not have any of these monochromatic cliques. And so we're done. Um, are there any questions about the sort of basic stepping up idea? Okay. So now I think I have just the right amount of time to say a bit about, okay, this is the basic stepping up limit. How do we use these ideas for uh, what we wanted to prove over there, stepping up to show lower bounds on these, now these hypergraphs, Q coloring, spanning a few colors, all that jazz. Um, so for higher uniformities, it turns out you can do the same argument and maintain the same number of color classes rather than what I did here, which was increase the number of color classes. And that's just by combining some of them um, based on what the patterns are. So for example, um, one thing you could do is say that uh, the new coloring chi prime, you could say something like it's red if the delta sequence is red and uh, monotone, so increasing and decreasing. Or if the second delta value is bigger than the first and the third. And you can say it's blue if the delta sequence is blue and monotone. Or if the second delta value is smaller than the first and the third. And then you can just sort of assign the edge colors arbitrarily otherwise. And it turns out that this coloring also works in a similar way that we did this. Um, and the idea is being able to find long monotone sequences in your delta sequence. Um, and so what we did for our new stepping up lemmas is to really analyze what's happening with the structure of the delta sequence sort of by itself and use things that we could prove uh, like about sequence properties um, to apply them to this stepping up context. Uh, so for new stepping up lemmas, um, we showed something that we called an erdos heinel sort of result for these delta sequences. So the erdos heinel problem for graphs is something of the flavor, you know, pick a, a collection of subgraphs that you say are called like forbidden subgraphs, and every graph has either a large clique or independent set or one of your forbidden subgraphs, or many of your forbidden subgraphs, depending on what sort of problem you're looking at. And we did a similar thing, but in the context of sequences. So we showed an erdos heinel result sequences 
Um, with respect to, uh, let's say, a forbidden uh, type of subsequence. And we said, you know, either uh, the delta sequence has a long monotone subsequence or many of the forbidden subsequences. Um, and it turns out, what does many mean? So the maximum sort of number of forbidden subsequences uh, under this, so we, we define this particular property that characterized forbidden. And then we said, how many possible forbidden things, how many subsequences could we forbid? Uh, it turns out that this was most, at most, um, let's say, forbidden subsequences uh, that were permutations of 1 through k. This was at most the kth Catalan number, which was sort of surprising. But we were able to get sort of an exact result on how many of these things we could uh, forbid. And uh, ultimately, let me not write anymore and just say how we use this. Um, in going back to this coloring, um, what we did is we partitioned the different permutations of K into classes where each would contain one of the forbidden subsequences. And so this Catalan number governed how many classes we could partition the permutations into. Um, so we have all of these classes of permutations of K, and we had at least one forbidden subsequence in each. And then we defined our color classes based on, okay, one class if they're mono, if it's if the delta sequence has something monotone increasing, if the sequence is monotone decreasing, or if it's in one of these classes, then we, we assign each of these a color class. Uh, and so ultimately, um, what we're able to show using this idea is a stepping up lemma. Let me let, let me erase this part. of something like, okay, if we take k plus 1 uniform, 2q plus p colors, so we did increase the number of colors in one of these, but we can also do a variant where we don't have to increase the number of colors. Um, so we show something like this. So it looks similar to other stepping up lemmas where we have, you know, uh, exponentially many more vertices, um, and we have to increase the size of the clique, but we're stepping up from K uniform to K plus one uniform. Okay, but let's remember what we wanted originally. We wanted that this bound uh, was bigger than some t tower of height log log K. So where does this log log come from? If we're stepping up one uniformity at a time, then probably one of these logs should not be here. Uh, it turns out that we can't actually apply this exact result to prove this bound. So star doesn't apply. It requires that P is at most the kth Catalan number, which you might know, is 1 over k plus 1 times 2k choose k. And now I want to bring your attention back to all these parameters I wrote here, seemingly for no reason. But you might notice that p needs to be 2k plus 1 choose k plus 1 here, uh, which is very slightly larger than 1 over k plus 1 times 2k choose k. And it's okay to make this bigger than or equal to, the, the lemma will still work. We can't say less than or equal to. 
it won't apply. So it turns out that we can't use this to prove the stepping up result we wanted. Instead, we have to use a much weaker stepping up result, which steps up from k uniform to 2k uniform. Uh, and that's where one of the logs comes from. The other log comes from sort of the starting place for our stepping up. So, um, so now thinking about, uh, since I'm basically out of time, thinking about open problems, right? Um, in terms of improving this lower bound for this clique Ramsey number and subsequently the hedgehog Ramsey number, um, one way to tackle this might be to look at this lemma because all we did in this lemma was take a coloring with um, nice cliques and produce a coloring with nice hedgehogs. But there's many ways to color a hedgehog. So maybe you could come up with a better coloring that would also give you the same result of no monochromatic hedgehogs. Um, and that could potentially get rid of this uh, dependence on P that requires it to be bigger than we would want it to be here. Uh, so that's, you know, one direction for, you know, furthering this, this line of research. Another is just to look at some questions uh, that were originally asked by Conlon, Fox, and Riddle that unfortunately we weren't able to answer even with our new stepping up lemmas. So something that still remains open is just for like one of the very small cases for these stepping up lemmas, going back to three uniform. Um, so something Conlon, Fox, and Riddle asked, does there exist some Q uh, such that if we look at three uniform uh, cliques, so right, KT, Q3, that this is double exponential. So what this means is can we construct a coloring on doubly exponentially many vertices, a Q coloring, um, so that every uh, KT is far from monochromatic, so spans at least two colors, uh, sorry, at least three colors. Um, and we're unable to answer this for the really silly reason that P is equal to three and C2 is equal to two and three is not less than two. So unfortunately, we can't use our methods to answer this question. Um, some progress was made on this uh, from Mubai and Souk, uh, showing uh, an exponential lower bound, but the double exponential remains open. Um, all right, so that's one interesting open question that's left from this, and I think my time is up, so I'll finish there. Can you explain uh, qualitatively the significance of the Catalan number in all this? Um, depends on what you mean by qualitatively and significant. So um, the sequence property that ends up being the number, the Catalan numbers, is not that surprising. So it's okay. essentially like we say, OK, a sequence has the left property, if we look at every, the, every interval, and we look at the maximum value of the sequence on every interval, and everything on the left of the maximum is bigger than everything to the right of the maximum. And you can pretty easily see, you know, if you think about it for a while, that the number of such sequences is a Catalan number by doing, you know, one of these Catalan bijections. It's probably in Stanley's books. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but why this is the right property um, is, yeah, is a, di is a different question of this. This is what came out from trying to optimize our erdos heinel result of either you must have a monotone subsequence or you must have some forbidden sequence. And the maximum number you could get is if you have every left property and also like right property where everything on the right is bigger than everything on the left inside your set of forbidden subsequences. 
And so that maximum number ends up being the Catalan number for this reason. Um, but yeah, why that is the correct sort of family for this erdos heinel question, I don't know that I have good sort of intuition for that question. Yeah. So was the, the first stepping up lemma kind of like example that you showed, was that essentially like the, the deltas originally that were C1 through C4, was that like the Mubayi soup type of? This was the original like erdos heinel oh, okay. stepping up lemma that they did in their 1972 paper. Um, their actual original, so I can't find their original paper, so it's just what I found in like the Graham Rothschild Spencer book on Ramsey theory but they go straight to doing it for K-uniform. So this is even a simplification of what they did in the general K-uniform case. Um, yeah, the K-uniform is, is more what I wrote here. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of variants on these stepping up lemmas for different scenarios, like in the Mubayi Souk paper, it's, it's slightly different from this, and ours is also slightly different from this. <laughs> of the four of us? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of hedgehogs. <laughs> but the name was originally from the... Conlon, Con Fox, and Riddle. Well, I would say that Antonio, of our co-authors, he was a really big fan of hedgehogs. He was the one who brought it to us and said, okay, we have these sequence results. I think we can apply them to this hedgehogs idea. We, Quentin and I just started with the sequences. Um, yeah, so maybe it's him. They, they do need to be, I'll put it this way, clique-based hedgehogs to do the stepping up that you want to do, right? You, you can't really thin them out or instead of you looking at all of the K over 2 sets, you, you can look at some subset. You really need them all to do. Yeah, I, that's my feeling. I don't have great intuition as to why this particular construction, hedgehogs, works as opposed to some, like, I imagine if you perturb them slightly, and come up with a family on that, it would still work. But I agree that like you really need that sort of dense structure with these like spines, um, these disjoint spines to really do this sort of um, this construction. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks again. Thanks for coming. Thank you.